open to Hebrews chapter 8, verse 10. I'll just quickly go over last week a quick summary. We are looking at the, the provisions of the new covenant. And last week, we talked about what that new covenant was. We talked about the, the need for the new covenant, why that was needful. We mentioned the key principle of that covenant, of this new covenant, is the faithfulness of Jesus. And we made mention that this new covenant operates under a new priesthood. Actually, sorry, not a new priesthood. To us is new, but it is a priesthood that has always existed. And when you look in scripture last week, we saw that this priesthood called um, the order of Melchizedek had existed before the children of Israel were even a nation. And we saw that that Melchizedek in Genesis was a man without, was king of righteousness, he was king of peace, a man without father and mother, a priest of God. And Abraham's actions showed he, the superiority of Melchizedek in that he gave a tenth of his of tithe, so tenth of his best um, to Melchizedek. And so we see that that came before the Aaronic priesthood. Now, the Aaronic priesthood, we know um, for simplicity, uh, just in summary, it's the um, old covenant. We, we saw that with it came the Mosaic law and it wasn't bad, but it was simply a shadow of the real thing. It had an expiry date and it could not make man perfect. Blood of goats and bulls cannot perfect a human being, but the benefits, it brought light to sin. So it brought an awareness of sin. It showed the wisdom of God. It pointed to Jesus Christ and it showed God's holiness. So we'll look again at continuing with the order of Melchizedek because the key principle of this new covenant is hinged, or should I say, is pinned on the faithfulness of Christ Jesus. Hebrews 8, verse 10. God here greatly explains, I'm reading in the Amplified, but what that covenant was. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will imprint my laws upon their minds, even upon their innermost thoughts and understanding, and engrave them upon their hearts. And I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And it will never more be necessary for each one to teach his neighbor and his fellow citizen, or each one of his brothers, saying, Know the Lord. For all will know me, Amen. from the smallest to the greatest of them. Amen. For I will be merciful and gracious towards their sins. And I will remember their deeds of unrighteousness no more. Amen. Now, this covenant that we have read, in a sense, gives us a bit of a hint as to the... Uh, in, in, in essence, points to the kingdom message. Because we can see evidently here that this covenant is meant for humanity. Where else 
will humanity say never will not find it necessary to teach their neighbor or their citizen to know the Lord. All will know the Lord from the smallest to the greatest of them. So we see here, it begins to give you a bit of an idea as to pointing to the kingdom message and really a little bit of a hint as to the totality of God's plan for mankind. Now we said something last week that the order is continual. It's a never ending priesthood. The limitation of the Aaronic priesthood was that the priests, one of the limitations was that the priest will die. But this priesthood is a priest that lives forever. Also, this is a priest that is perfect. He was the perfect sacrifice. So everything pertaining to perfection, all of that, which we'll look at later, but it all speaks to that. And I also stated, Romans 6, 9, that Christ had to qualify for this ministry. The qualification was his death and resurrection. Amen. Death had no dominion over him. Amen. And that is why somewhere in Revelation, it goes on to say, who is he that holds the keys of death and Hades? Amen. So to qualify for that position, he had to die. And you see it in Romans 8. You see that played out as well. So, And he had to leave a life as a human being. So what makes his priesthood fantastic and awesome priesthood is that he isn't a priest that is on, doesn't, that doesn't have an understanding of what we go through. Like us, he faced temptations. But that's what makes him the perfect high priest in that because he was like man and like God, but because he was like man and went through temptations, he is the perfect arbiter, the first perfect mediator, the perfect intercessor between man and God. Amen. So, now I also wanted to add that the difference in the Melchizedek order and the order of Aaron was that the Melchizedek priesthood, there were king, was a king and a priest. Now, and I said this last week, if Jesus Christ was born from the tribe of Levi, it would not make the order of Melchizedek valid. It would still be from the order of Aaron. So to prove to mankind, and we see by two immutable things where it was impossible for God to lie, part of the proof to mankind was, okay, a showing man a different order, an order that is eternal, and it came from Judah. Also, to show that it is not just a priestly order, but a royal order, it had to come from Judah. Amen. Genesis 49, verse 10. The scepter of leadership shall not depart from where? Judah. Judah nor the ruler's staff from between his feet until Shiloh, the Messiah, the peaceful one, comes to whom it belongs and to whom shall be the obedience of the people. So it was done on purpose. The legitimacy of his being a king and a priest in that, that, is, that is the principle of that order, he had to come from a different tribe and he had to come from Judah. So you see the line of Jesus Christ's lineage is Judah. That's why David is his descendant. And that's why even David was able to, in a sense, tap into really a, um, a, 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 a future, um, basically what we're operating in now. Because the scripture says we are a royal priesthood. That's what Peter says. So David was able to tap into something ahead of his time, among many other things. Can we open... Okay, so now I wanted to focus more so 
on um, Hebrews chapter 7, verse 25 to 28. Now we know that he is a faithful high priest, but we now need to understand when his, his job, when it means to save unto the uttermost. Hebrews chapter 7, verse 25 to 28. If maybe I'll read from verse 22 or 21. For those who formerly became priests received their office without it being confirmed by the taking of an oath by God. But this one was designated and addressed and saluted with an oath. The Lord has sworn and will not regret it or change his mind. You are a priest forever, mm -hmm. according to the order of Melchizedek. In keeping with the oath's greater strength, Jesus has become the guarantee of a better agreement, a more excellent and more advantageous covenant. Again, the former successive line of priests was made up of many, because they were each prevented by death from continuing, continuing perpetually in office. But he holds his priesthood unchangeably because he lives forever. Therefore, on the basis of him being able to live forever, he is able to save to the uttermost, completely, perfectly, finally, and for all time and eternity. Amen. Those who come to God through him, since he is always living to make petition and intercede with him and intervene for them. Here is the high priest, perfectly adapted to our needs, as was fitting, holy, blameless, unstained by sin, separated from sinners and exalted higher than the heavens. Amen. He has no day yes. by day necessity as do each of these other high priests mm -hmm. to offer sacrifice first of all for his own personal sins mm -hmm. and then for those of the people because he met all the requirements yeah. once and for all yes. when he brought himself as a sacrifice which he offered up. Amen. 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 So we see that the, that the ministry of Christ Jesus, the, the very definition of this order, it is to save God's people to the uttermost, to the greatest degree, to completion, to fullness. So that is why for him to do that, he has to be, a, his priesthood must be uninterrupted. And his priesthood must be perfect, which it is, because he offered himself as a sacrifice. Now, Christ being a priest, um, and this, of course, speaks to his commitment. That is why we talk about the faithfulness of Jesus Christ. It is important for us as believers to know our God. Because as you know him, you begin to know his faithfulness towards you. The scripture says that the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. It says his mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is thine faithfulness. So God is faithful to each and every one of us. And he proved that faithfulness by his death and resurrection. John 3.16, God so loved the world. That he gave his only begotten son. Whosoever believeth in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. Sometimes we just quote the, this Bible verse and it's an easy Bible. But we, do we really understand what is inside there and what that means for us? So, there are... What does it mean or what does it entail in terms of the uttermost? And how will these new covenant promises or the new covenant be worked in us? Anybody who knows programming, if you have a, let me use Java as, example, as an example, you can have your code. You can write it out to do what it needs to do. 
But the code is only useful when executed. When you execute your code, you set the varying things, so the path with which it needs to be executed on, you know, the very things that you need to do to, to make sure it executes, then it will run. But if the code is just there, I mean, it's good, it does what it needs to do, but only to those who choose to execute that code. The very same way is this covenant that we have with Christ Jesus and our salvation. The Bible says it's been given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness. It's given unto us. But the question is, as a people, what do you make of it? What do you do with it? How do you exercise it? I would say that there are four things that the Lord has given unto us to execute and ensure that the new covenant that we read, that you write the laws in our minds and on our hearts, is his blood, his word, his love, and his Holy Spirit. So that's what the Lord has given unto us. I just wanted to explain something here quickly. And this is the aspect of the law and really in the aspect of the working of this new covenant in us. Romans chapter 8. One of the simplest ways to simply explain this is Romans 8. Romans 8, Romans 7 and Romans 8 was basically Paul's message, um, specifically at least to, to the Jews. He was trying to tell them about the old covenant and basically how it is um, gone away. Remember, I think it's in Hebrews 7, 12, that a change in the priesthood means a change in the law. So the law has changed. And um, Romans chapter 7, Paul is explaining to them the law in just in summary. He goes on to say that the law is good, but it is the law that leads to sin and death. The law is holy, but the law has been, is, is no more in, um, is no more at work. Christ Jesus' death and resurrection and the changing of the priesthood introduced a brand new law. He's trying to point to the uh, children of Israel that this law if you, is only a law that if it, it, it cannot perfect man. So um, he goes on to point about the aspect of the flesh and how mankind more often than not attempts to use the flesh. You know, use the flesh. So you try to will things your own way by your works. And all it does is it makes you <laughs> rebel even more. That's through the flesh. So that is why Paul goes on to say that the law, he references that the law that leads to sin and death, although he says law of sin and death, the law that leads to sin and death, that is the human body, the human, sorry, not the human body, human beings by our nature, when hearing of the law, the response of, of the flesh is not to conform to it, but to rebel. That is the response. And that is why Paul goes on to say that it, the law was what awakened sin. sin. Because that is the nature of the flesh. So if you're using the flesh, your mind, any other way to try and achieve holiness, righteousness, other religions attempt to do that. They meditate and they do all kinds of things to attempt to reach what they believe is holiness. It, it cannot work. Paul is trying to say, ultimately, it will lead to sin and it will lead to death. But he makes a distinction that the law is not sinful. It's not the law doing it. It's the nature of mankind. It's man's nature, the fallen nature, the sinful nature's response. The law is perfect. And he points out that if, if not for the law, we would not have known that thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not kill. But... And even in Romans 4.13, it goes on to say that the law in and of itself worketh wrath. So what then is the, the new law? That's where Romans 8 now comes in. There's something that I notice in scripture. 
and the Lord will help us. Part of the new covenant and walking in the new covenant is giving your understanding of following something, giving it unto God. Our, the way with which human beings follow things, so you, you follow leaders, you follow like whatever, ideologies. We don't follow Christ like that. Where we, is by works. So for instance, if you want to follow a certain political party, uh, you volunteer. Let's say you want to work for the Liberal Party or NDP or Conservative or whatever. You go, you volunteer, you do all these things, you work for them until you, you can grow in the party. When it comes to the things of God, there is now a new frame of mind that God is trying to teach mankind. And that is total trust in him. And that is why the aspect of faith is so key and plays a huge role. And okay, let's open to Romans chapter 4. Romans 4. Verse 7. Let me start from... Yeah, okay. I will start from verse, I'll just read from verse 1. If so, what shall we say about Abraham, our forefather, humanly speaking? For if Abraham was justified by good works, he has grounds for boasting, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed in, trusted in God, and it was credited to his account as righteousness. Now, to be a laborer, his wages are not counted as a favor or a gift, but as an obligation. That is something owed to him. But to the one who, not walking by the law, trusts in him, who justifies the ungodly, his faith is credited to him as righteousness. Thus, David congratulates the man and pronounces a blessing on him to whom God credits righteousness apart from the works he does. Blessed and happy and to be envied are those whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered up and completely buried. Blessed and happy and to be envied is the person of whose sin the Lord will take no account nor reckon it against him. David here had seen these things and this is why he this is prophetic. This is why he was saying, blessed and happy are every are those whose iniquities are forgiven. Or in another scripture in Psalm 16, he says, the lines are fallen unto them, unto us in pleasant places, who have a goodly, because we have a goodly heritage. Or, thou will not leave my soul in Sheol, neither will you suffer your holy ones to see corruption. David saw the promise. He saw Jesus. He saw Calvary. He saw the consequences of the new covenant, or, or should I say, the, the, the follow-up of the new covenant. And he proclaimed that God, bless our day, that God can credit a people for just believing righteousness. Is this blessing, verse 9, then meant only for the circumcised or also for the uncircumcised we say that faith was credited to Abraham as righteousness. Let me scroll. Okay, I'll go down to verse 13. For the promise to Abraham or his posterity that he should inherit the world did not come through observing the commands of the law, but through the righteousness of faith. If it is the adherent of the law who are to be the heirs, then faith is made futile and empty of all meaning. And the promise of God is made void. For the law results in divine wrath. But where there is no law, there is no transgression. So we see here that it is not the inheriting of the law. It is not by the law 
that we come unto righteousness. And Romans chapter 8, if we can go to Romans chapter 8, greatly explains this. How do we have this new covenant executed and effected in us? There is therefore now no condemnation to them who are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. Remember, in Hebrews chapter 7 verse 12, we said where there is a new priesthood, there is a new law. So we see that there is a new law in effect. Now I notice something in scripture. The difficulty for human beings now is laying, this walking through the aspect of faith, laying on all our livelihood in Christ or on Christ. If you notice, about 183 times in the New Testament, it is mentioned in Christ, in him. All these things are not done by our own power. It is done in Christ. But that's the difficulty of humans. And I was sharing with the young ones early this morning. What was the first thing that Jesus Christ said when he was asked, somebody asked him they wanted to be his disciple. What was Jesus' first reply? Deny yourself. Deny yourself. So human beings have a tendency to want to trust in the flesh. To try to do things by their own works because... In essence, they want to have glory. But here comes a new way of doing things where you put your trust in the great high priest, the faithful high priest. It's not easy. So Paul goes on to say in Romans chapter, after saying in Romans chapter 7, basically that the flesh will only lead you to death, he goes on to say, there is no condemnation to them who are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. For the law of the spirit of life, which is where? In Christ Jesus, has made me free from the law of sin and death. What Christ did when he died and resurrected was he took that, those works, that onus for us to walk for it and placed it on himself. He did it. He made that sacrifice. And all we need to now do as believers is to just go through him. Amen. And on top of that, by going through him, there are certain key things that we get from it. One of which is grace, mercy, love, his blood, his word, help along the way, his Holy Spirit. Amen. He says, for what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh. So it tells you that the, res the, the response of the flesh, or sorry, the law cannot operate through the flesh because it, the flesh in and of itself is hostile to it. So the law is weak. God sending his son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh. So that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us. That is so smart <laughs> from God. God could have come in his holiness and glory, if that were possible, and died on the cross. And he would not have done anything. But he had to come in the flesh. Amen. Now, the trick is that he is also God, fully God, but also fully man. Then what happened? By condemning sin in the flesh, all of a sudden, through Christ Jesus' righteousness, we can experience it. Amen. That is why there's, a, there's somewhere in scripture where it says that people can, in, on this earth, walk in godliness. Yes. They can walk perfect. Yes. It's not by their own uh, self, okay, I prayed 90 hours, the 50 day fast, 60 day fast, which are good things. But it is that simple aspect of just faith. Amen. And you just trust in God. You lay it down on his feet. That's the difficulty with human beings. Human beings have to unlearn. In fact, that was something that the children of Israel, that wilderness experience, the whole purpose of it was to break all those human tendencies. The human tendency to trust in you. Look, in, look that, that's just unfortunately the, the, the natural reaction of the fall and the fallen nature of human beings. When stuff is going wrong, immediately you look into yourself, you're looking to your finances, 
You're looking to your intellect. You're look, you don't, a lot of people will not look to Christ. Even Peter, when Christ told him to walk at the command of Christ, what happened? He looked at the waves and he started to sink. He walked. He didn't enter, get on the water and sink. He actually walked. But he saw the tumultuousness of the waves. A lot of times that speaks of life. But what did Jesus, all, all he needs to do was look to Jesus. Hallelujah. But you see, the children of Israel, and they serve as a caution for us, was that there were a lot of provisions, even going through the wilderness. The scripture says that their clothes never uh, got torn. It grew with them. They saw the pillar of cloud by day, the pillar of fire by night. In moments of grumbling and murmuring, the Lord visited them. The Bible says the rock that followed them. So the Lord was always with them. And yet, there came a point where they said, well, life was better in Egypt. At least in Egypt we had this, we had that, we had this. The Lord will help us to look to Jesus. Because that is an important aspect of this new covenant. For they that after the flesh, verse 5, do mind the things of the flesh. But they that after the spirit, the things of the spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God. For it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. But ye, I'm skipping to verse 9, are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. Amen. If we want... To have this, as we read the new covenant in Hebrews chapter 8 verse 10, if we want that effected in us, we must walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. But ye are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If so be that the spirit of God dwell in you. Now if any man have not the spirit of Christ, he is none of his. Then it goes on to show something. So, I will scroll down to, where was this? I think it's, um, yes, verse 14. So we see, of course, in verse 13, if you live after the flesh, you shall die. But if you through the spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, you shall live. Then, here is another aspect of the covenant that we receive. And this is what now coincides with saving unto the uttermost. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. Hallelujah. For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption. Whereby we cry, Abba, Father. So under the new covenant, this is why... John wrote, he says, Behold what manner of love the Father has given unto us that we should be called the sons of God. Through this new covenant, God now calls us into sonship. It's not enough that he just saves a people. But part of the package of salvation is you are now a son. And that's why the scripture goes on to say that as many as received and believed in him, to them gave you power to be called the sons of God. So now there is a spirit of adoption. Now we start to talk about the plan, that covenant plan. We start to see what that could lead to for humanity and what that could lead to, do to them who believe. Under this new covenant, through the love of God, we are seen as the sons of God. And now we become heirs with Christ. We are now joint heirs. What does Christ then inherit? Um, I think it's Galatians 4, verse 7. Actually, no, sorry. It goes on to say, yeah, where thou art no more a servant, but a son, and if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. Let's see. Oh, yeah, sorry. Romans chapter 4, verse 13. 
Romans chapter 4, verse 13. Amen. For the promise that he should be the heir of the world Amen. was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. Yeah. So we see here that just trying to find the aspect of Christ's inheritance, where it says he inherits the war. I think it's Galatians. Where it says that Christ inherited the world, he inherits all things. Yeah, one. One Sorry, two. one, two. Yes, thank you so much. Yes, I did not write that down. Hebrews 1, 2. Hath in these last days, first verse, God who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake in times past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things. things. Amen. So, if he then is the heir of all things, and we are joint heirs, the Bible says both he that are sanctified and they that are sanctified are all one, and he's not afraid to call them brethren. If we then are joint heirs, what then we inherit? Amen. We inherit all Amen. things. Amen. That's the covenant. It's not to go to heaven and we sing forever. No. That's not the gospel. The gospel is to inherit all things. We see that. And that's why it speaks about dominion. Genesis 1, 26, 28. Genesis 1, 26 to 28. And God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion Hallelujah. over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, over the cattle, over all the earth. Hallelujah. And every creeping thing that creepeth upon the amen, earth. Amen, amen, amen. So God created man in his image and in the image of God created he, he him, male and female created he, he them. And God blessed them and God said unto them, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea, for the fowl of the air and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. We also see how this dominion plays out and God's promise, Revelation 5 verse 10. Verse 9. And they sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof, for thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by the blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation, and has made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. So there is a place of rulership. That's what it means by saving unto the uttermost. Amen. That uttermost, we see the end result is to rule and reign. Amen. And so we see first a people become born again, they are adopted. Amen. They become sons. And as sons, immediately now, you become the focus of your father and his business. Oh. Begins to bring you up he begins to train you. He begins to teach you of his ways. He begins to teach you of the secrets, the innermost secrets. He begins to show you things to prepare you for rulership. Amen. That is what we all are here for. That is the, that is the hope of our calling. Amen. Now, here's the amazing thing about it. It is that it is still all in Christ. Because remember... There's a, there's a place in scripture where it says that he shall put everything under his feet. 
and then he shall give it to God. So it is all through Christ. Part of the problem with Adam and Eve, when they, that's why God told them not to eat of the uh, tree of knowledge. Tree of knowledge. Say, don't eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Because the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, basically, in summary, what it is, is man can rule by his own accord, separate from God. When you eat of the tree of life, you, you eat of the things of God. You eat of Christ. You eat of him. And you have the mindset, as is the covenant stated, that I will write upon their mind, and I will engrave in their heart righteousness. But the tree of knowledge of good and evil is what the world operates at the moment, the world's wisdom. Rule by our own knowledge. We're not interested in co-ruling. We're not, we're not interested in joint heirs. We do our own thing. But we see God, it's not that God was caught unawares. He already knew what man would do. That's why the Bible says the lamb that was slain before the world began. So the provisions were there. But you see the mess of the world man has made. We've created demonic systems. We are walking in sin. We are dying. And we are even attempting to find ways to abate death. So you hear fountain of youth. You, you hear, if you read some history, funny people who did wicked things because they didn't want to die. The answer has always been in Jesus. But man does not want to accept that. So that is where the aspect of eating and that's why we said, what are the key things? His blood. Romans, Revelations 12, 11. We'll go over these quickly and then we'll pray. They are key principles. They overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. So overcoming came by the blood of Jesus. It's not by our own will. God revealed this, and I think I said this last week, God revealed this to the remnant in a measure. It was to Zerubbabel. They had struggled to build the temple for 20 years. They were getting all manner of threats from all kinds of people, all manner of nations. They were being reported. In fact, the report that was written to the kings was that if these people were to build this temple, they would no more pay tribute, tax, and toll. So the work stopped. But then, let us open to, we'll just read it, Zechariah chapter, I think it's chapter 4. Yes, chapter 4, verse 6. Just to show you God's mercy, God's grace, and that it is not by our might. Then he answered and spake unto me, saying, This is the word of the Lord unto Zerubbabel, saying, It is not by might, it is not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts, who art thou, O great mountain, before Zerubbabel. Thou shalt become a plain, and he shall bring forth the headstone. Thereof with shouting, crying, grace, grace unto it. Why, why? Look, this, this is prophetic. In their own head, like, because I guess what they had witnessed, they had gone almost 20 years, they had abandoned the temple. If you read Haggai, the word of the Lord came to the people. You have abandoned my temple. You are focusing on yourself. You are focusing on your own house while my stands in disrepute. And this Haggai, along with Zechariah, who were co-prophets, came and preached unto them. And I think I mentioned this last week, the state of the priesthood was bad, that Joshua the high priest had filthy garments. Who knows what he was doing? He was not doing his duty. He was not walking in holiness. But you see God's mercy. You see God's grace. And it was all done by the Spirit of God. And so that is why when they laid the capstone, that is the final piece of the temple. Their shouting was grace. It's grace. Because they realized that it was by the mere grace of God. These guys had tapped into something before their time. 
the mere grace of God that they were able to finish the work. Likewise, us as well. When it comes, this is part of the provisions of this new covenant. We'll go back to Romans again, Romans chapter 4, where it says, It is by faith through grace. 416, thank you. It says, Therefore, it is of faith that it might be by grace to the end of promise might be sure to all the seed, not to that only which is of the law, but to that also which is of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. So you see the importance of what happens in it. That's why David was so happy that oh, you're not going to impute to them their sin. You're going to look over their iniquity. And we see that in Hebrews, in Hebrews 8, that was part of the covenant. I will look at their sin no more. I will look, I will not look, I will not hold them to it anymore because of my blood, because of grace, because of my love for them. Hallelujah. Now, Paul, of course, goes down to greatly explain the aspect of grace. Is it an excuse to sin? No. And he, great, he, he shows it that there is a power in the aspect of grace, in that principle of grace. Grace is not an excuse to sin. Grace, rather, helps a person to stand. Yes. A person will fall. The blood of Jesus is already there, the remission of sin, so we have the ability to stand up again and come before him. That's grace. And we didn't deserve it. That's why in the Hebrew, the word for grace is, um, it, the, the definition is unmerited favor. It's favor. Then again, that is why I said, David saw this and said, the lines are fallen onto us in pleasant places. Because of our goodly heritage. Because we've been adopted as sons. Amen. On the basis of that heritage alone, the lines are falling onto us in pleasant places. Amen. So that is what comes. These are part of the principles. This Christ's faithfulness to us is grace. For lack of time, you know, we won't go into that. And you know, but these are the things we ought to look into. His love, which comes, the aspect of grace is part of that. His word, his blood, and his Holy Spirit. In fact, that's the last one. Romans chapter 8. Romans 8, verse 26. Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities. For we know not what we should pray for as we ought. But the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. And he that searcheth the heart knows what is the mind of the Spirit because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. And that's why Paul closed, um, closed off Romans that we are more than conquerors. What then shall we say of all of who are more than conquerors? What can separate us from the love of God? When he read, when he saw all of this going through scripture and the Lord is revealing these things unto us, all he saw was God's love. Amen. So the Lord will help us. I want us to, oh yes, one last thing, Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10 now tells us from verse 19. After hearing all of this, because it's very easy, okay, we have grace, or oh, we have God's love, and we can relax. No. He says, having therefore brethren boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he had consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say his flesh, and having an high priest over the house of God, there is a response. Let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promised. Let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works 
not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another and so much the more as ye see the day approaching. For if we sin willfully, this is a hard thing to take in. For if we sin willfully, after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation we shall devour the advers adversaries. He that despised Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses. Of how much sorrow punishment, suppose ye, shall he be thought worthy who had trodden underfoot the Son of God and had counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing and who had done despite unto the Spirit of grace. For we know him that had said, Vengeance belongeth unto me. I will recompense, says the Lord, and again the Lord shall judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. So, we see here that there is a response expected from us and God's people. Upon knowing all of this, we, we are therefore to draw nigh. We are to draw nigh. The expectation is we are to come to him. Because again, we are coming with a, a heart in full assurance of faith. We know we cannot lose. We know that there is no, there is no, there is no way we can lose. It's impossible. So now, all we now need to do is take that step. And that's why I, I, the, the, the Holy Spirit dropped that song in me. Step by step, you lead me. But we must begin to start to unlearn the fallen nature way of thinking. Amen. How do we do that? We already said the things are given unto one. It's very simple. It's by being in fellowship. One of the other is by walking in love. One of the other ways is by praying. One of the other ways is by renewing your mind. Submitting yourself as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God. As Paul says, that is our basic service. One of the other ways is by listening, reading, studying his word. Because as you do that, then that covenant, that covenant he has made with man, you begin to see it. It's working, it's working. A people are changing. A people, all of a sudden, they are now starting to break forth. A people are now starting to, to walk in maturity. A people are now, you, you saw it in scripture. Even when Paul was, I think, on the island of Crete, <laughs> where the snake beat him, he just shook it off. And they thought he was God. They thought he was a God. That is not by Paul's doing. No. That is part of the promise. That's the promise of the new covenant. That's life inside him. Yes. Yes. So let's begin to pray.